hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. Today, my guest is Catherine Hale. Catherine, why don't you introduce yourself to people and tell folks what you do? Sure. So I am a climate scientist, and I specifically look at how climate change affects us here and now in the places where we live. My last name is Hayho, and the reason why it's Hayho is because of the last big pandemic. Back in the 1918, 1917 time, we had the Spanish flu pandemic, which is the biggest one until the coronavirus pandemic. And my grandfather was orphaned. Both of his parents passed away from respiratory diseases related to the flu. So he was adopted by his aunt, and his aunt was married to a man named Hayho. So my last name is actually Scott Hayho because of a flu pandemic. That is, <laughs> wow, interesting. Uh, and here we are. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so why don't you go a little more into depth into your um, specific research and your background? Sure. Um, people often say, well, you know, what is a climate scientist? Because you can't really get a degree in climate science. Um, my undergraduate degree is in astrophysics. And amazingly, it's the pretty much the exact same physics that applies to this planet as applies anywhere in the universe. And my master's and PhD are in atmospheric science. So specifically studying the science of the atmosphere. What I do now is I work with cities and states and organizations to look specifically at how climate change is loading the dice against them. What I mean by that is we always have, you know, a chance of rolling a double six. That's a hurricane or a heat wave or a flood or a drought. But as climate changes, decade by decade, it's like it's sneaking in and taking another one of those numbers and turning them into a six or even a seven in some cases. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing three 500-year flood events in three years, or we're seeing record-breaking bushfires like the ones in Australia or California that we haven't seen before. And they are affecting us here and now. It's no longer a future issue. So I work with people and organizations to try to look ahead, to try to prepare for what's coming, and try to make sure that we're ready when it comes. Wow. So what are you learning uh, with during this new crisis with, with everyone um, quarantining themselves and places, oh. like time, <laughs> places like Times Square are empty uh, all of a sudden and, and very few. I had to, early on in this thing, I had to, I had to drive from LA to Wisconsin about a four day journey and it was um the most eerie and, and and things this is a while ago things have gotten much 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 more locked down since the time that i did this and even at that time there was like some semis and a few other people with their cars packed full of stuff on the road and that and that was about it it was uh it was apocalyptic back then and that was that was weeks ago um and and so so this is um, uh, this is a dramatic change in terms of uh, humans' um, impact on the environment. It is huge. I mean, I was in the same boat. So I was actually giving a series of lectures in Ireland and Scotland when this all broke. So literally within a matter of hours, I had most of my events canceled. I was, you know, literally heading to somewhere when they're like, I'm sorry, we can't do this. After all, the university just closed. So I got back home as soon as I could. My family was really worried. I wanted to make sure I got back, especially since I'm not a U.S. citizen, before any borders got closed. Um, and it was eerie. So I had seen the news of, you know, the immigration halls crowded with thousands of people. So if you didn't have COVID-19, you had it by the time you left that immigration hall, if there was somebody there who had it. Right. So I was prepared for the worst. I had like hand sanitizer and, you know, masks and water. And then I got to the immigration hall and there was nobody. It was just deserted. There was nobody in the airport. There was nothing. Hmm. I mean, it was crazy. So it's been really, really interesting because um, first of all, we are seeing people act around the world. The first thing that I've learned is when push comes to shove, when disaster is staring us in the face, we are ready to act together across the whole world, across every country, we are ready to do what it takes. I love the meme that says, you know, when else are you going to be offered a chance to save the world by staying home? Take yeah. it. <laughs> so yeah. people are doing that. And that is so incredibly encouraging because it suggests that when we finally realize that climate change is just as devastating, when we finally realize that the reason we care about climate change is the exact same reason we care about the pandemic. 
because it affects our health and our welfare of ourselves and our families and our loved ones and our friends and the places where we live. When we connect the dots, we will act. But here's what I'm scared of. I'm scared that we're not going to connect those dots in time to act on climate change because we already see that states that took early action and countries that took early action were able to bend the curve on the pandemic. But people who are saying, oh, no, it's okay, come to the beaches for spring break, we're still open for business, their curve did not get bent because they didn't take action soon enough. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, the same is true for climate change, except over a bit of a longer time horizon to where we have to take action well before, and I'm talking years to decades before we see the actual disaster staring us in the face, or else it's going to be too late. Yeah, this is, uh, I, I see a lot of people kind of making the point that of looking for um, some of the silver linings to come out of this um, and and the many ways in which this can be a catalyst for um, positive change. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, of course, this is an absolutely awful situation for yeah. everybody and and some people more than uh, more than others. And and it's a, a difficult thing to when uh, someone's worrying about how they're going to eat tomorrow to be like, well, the good news is this is going to help us 30 years from now, but, but uh, this, this may be a time um, that humanity as a whole looks back at as, as this learning experience that was able to pump the brakes a little bit on, on this kind of, uh, it, you know, it, it, from, um, from a global warming perspective, some people, Mm -hmm. um, kind of think humanity is is zooming towards the cliff mm -hmm. and uh, and this might be something that's uh, that's helping us pump the brakes and raise a little bit more awareness yes well so first of all I would say that um, what we're seeing in poor countries is really heartbreaking I was on a call yesterday with colleagues from around the world um, I'm actually the climate ambassador for the World Evangelical Alliance um, mm. here in the US evangelicals are well known for rejecting climate science but here in the US, evangelical is more of a political term than a religious term. And around the rest of the world, evangelicals are leading on climate action. Um, and so we were talking with leaders from South America, from South Africa, from uh, Southeast Asia, and they were saying that the situation is devastating because the middle class, you know, the people who have lifestyles like we would have here, the middle class is stocked up on food, they're running their air conditioners, they're sitting in their home, they're still getting their paychecks and poor people are just being absolutely devastated by the food shortages, by the requirement to stay home when they have to feed their families, by job losses. I mean, mm -hmm. even right now it's devastating. And now granted, air pollution has significantly improved. It's improved over China, it's improved over Italy. We just saw new measurements today for um, Canada that showed that air pollution was way down over major cities. And one of my colleagues at Stanford, um, a scientist called Marshall Burke, he's actually estimated that the reduction in air pollution could actually save as many or more lives than were lost to coronavirus in China, for example. Hmm. But at the same time, as soon as the pandemic passes, we're likely to ramp everything right back up again. And all the production powered by fossil fuels, all the transportation that causes this air pollution, it's likely, I hate to say, to ramp right back up again. And with fossil fuel prices at record lows, I mean, we haven't seen gas prices like this since I don't know when. <clears throat> when I was a student or earlier, we are likely to see people focusing on just getting the economy back on track no matter what it takes. And currently in the US, the administration is already using this as an excuse to cut environmental regulations across the board to help all the big polluters rather than the small business owners who are the people who are really suffering from this. And they're using it as, as a reason to just you know, keep on moving us backwards in time rather than forwards into the future. So I'm really afraid that long-term the, the news is not gonna be good for climate change either. Mm. Well, <laughs> and I'm usually an optimistic person. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it's possible that. Uh, do Do you think that it's possible that it will um, change some minds amongst the general public, yes. um, and, and make them a little bit more aware as as this kind of. Um, significant you know you know it's one thing to tell people that like well the the um average global temperature has been ri rising by half a degree or whatever for each and and then people can be like well good i was cold during winter anyway and and yes. 
uh, or whatever ridiculous thing. Uh, so, but now having things like satellite images of, of um, areas of say China before and after all of this came to a halt and, and when you can kind of see the dissipation of air pollution alone, for example, um, it, you know, this is, it, it seems to me at least as traumatic as some of the, I think, um, uh, you know, startling footage of ice caps um, melting that, that I think a lot of people see and it, it, it at least gets them thinking um, a little mm -hmm. bit more. And so, yeah. so in terms of that, if, if people, if it leads to maybe being less climate deniers, potentially that changes how we vote and then potentially politicians have to cater to a new demand for more um, environmental regulations. I mean, that, that's, is, is that just in, incredibly optimistic or just completely uh, like just n impossible and not going to happen from your point of view? Uh, no, I think there's definitely a grain of truth in there. And let's kind of dig into this a little bit. Okay. Because um, if we put the pieces together, it does make sense. And where I want to start is I want to start with something you said about, you know, convincing climate deniers. So we hear in the news all the time in the media, people often really focus on people who reject the science. But when we look at where people actually fall across the spectrum, and there's this really amazing thing called the Yale uh, Program on Climate Communications, Six Americas of Global Warming. They divide people into six groups. And it turns out that 58% of us are either alarmed or concerned about climate change, 58%. And then after that, they have a group that's cautious, and cautious people are about 20%, just over 20%, so they're a pretty big group too. Then we have people who are disengaged. They'd have to be living under a rock the last 10 years, but there are a few of us who've been living under a rock, so it's a small group of disengaged. And then 10% of us are doubtful, and 10% of us are dismissive. Mm. So we focus disproportionately on the doubtful and dismissive who get the headlines for saying really ridiculous things like, you right. know, the ice caps on Mars are warming, so obviously climate change isn't human, or you know, one volcano produces more pollution than all humans do in 10 years, which is completely false. Right. Um, but that's a minority of the that's, public That's perception. the vast minority. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the Yale public opinion maps, they have these amazing maps that cover the whole US by every county and by every congressional district. And they ask people a series of 20 questions. And they say, you know, do you think that climate is changing? And over 70% of people say yes. It's changing. They say, do you think it will affect plants and animals? Yes. Will it affect future generations? Yes. Will it affect people in developing countries? Yes. Then they say, will it affect you personally? And all of a sudden, the numbers just plummet. Mm. They're cut in half. So people who say, yes, climate change is real. I support the scientists. The science is real. Absolutely. They don't think it will affect us. Psychological distance is one of the biggest problems we have. We think it matters to people in the future, not now. We think it matters to people and animals and plants far away, but not here. And we think it matters to things that matter to environmentalists, but we don't think it matters to us. Like we don't think it matters to our health or the economy or national security or our kids' health or the well-being of where we live or our favorite hobby, whether it's skiing or birding or cooking or you know, fishing. We don't think it matters to us. So I completely agree with you. I think that the pandemic has brought home the fact that we are all interconnected, that what happens in a single wildlife market in China can shut down the entire world. And if that's the case, then obviously something like climate change can affect us all. So yes, I do think there is hope in that regards. Hmm. Yeah, it reminds me of it. There's a thing I, I never recorded this or anything, but I used to I used to do this uh, apocalypse comedian character on stage that I should really dust off and, <laughs> and bring back. Um, but uh, but I it, it was it was kind of regarding um, nuclear war and and some people's perception that like. Well, as long as you get the other guys first, you know, that's it. And so I, I, was, I set it up by saying like, well, uh, you know, the, the, uh, I was reading this article about how um, uh, 
you know, like India and Afghanistan or something each have like 200 nukes each. And if they were to ever launch them both at one another, uh, the, the, the smoke and the fires from all of that would, would cloud the earth. You'd have what's called a nuclear winter and, and, uh, and it'd black out the sun for about eight years. All the crops would die. The animals would die. And, the sun. <laughs> and, 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 right. and I was thinking about all this and I was thinking, yeah, but how does that affect me? Uh, and then, <laughs> yes. And then, and then I'd launch into a little character that was uh, doing stand up for the apocalypse. But, but it, but it's kind of reminiscent of of that, where um, where you can say all of these things about what might happen thirty years from now or whatever. And and then the other, I mean, I guess the other argument that people will have um, or tell themselves myself included is that it um it, it, it no, this isn't generally what i think it just like the the uh self deception that i find myself thinking once in a while is just like oh they'll figure it out like the the people trying to figure it they'll figure it out they'll figure out novel solutions yeah. science is incredible uh, they'll take care of it for us so uh, oh, i oh i th i think that myself sometimes too <laughs> yes. yeah and then I read a few climate science papers and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> it's not yeah. happening. Fast. Yeah. No, no, I agree with you. And, and a big part of that is this, I think we've been told, so we're told about this huge global problem that could end civilization as we know it, right? I mean, the planet will still be orbiting the sun, but we won't have human civilization on it. We'll be, you know, scavengers kind of picking through the wreckage of our civilization as they do in the novels that everybody reads and the movies everybody sees. Um, and so, so we think, though, that there's this huge global problem, and what are we told to do to fix it? We are told to change our light bulbs and to eat less meat. Mm. And so, you know, intuitively, me changing my light bulbs and recycling and eating less meat, intuitively, in the back of my brain, even not as a scientist, I'm like, I don't think that's going to fix a global problem. So we're being told that what we can do is completely out of proportion to the actual problem. Mm. And that's why um, when they asked me to do a TED talk, that's why I figured, okay, I'm going to tackle this because we don't think it matters to us and we don't think there's anything we can do to fix it. So we have to tackle these two problems right on. And how do we do that? We do that by doing what those Yale maps found was the most, the thing that most people said no to. When they did those whole series of 20 questions, the question that most people said no to is, do you ever talk about it or hear somebody else talk about it? And the answer mm. was no. And if we don't talk about it, why would we think it matters? And if we don't think it matters, why would we think we can do anything to fix it? So my TED Talk is all about how having conversations about how it matters to us here and now, not in the future, not way over there on the other side of the world, but right here, and talking about real things that we can do to fix it. Hmm. Like, yes, personal solutions matter, but using our voice to advocate for change at, you know, the school that we go to, the business that we're part of, the organization that we're part of, um, the city that we belong to, using our voice is one of the most important things we can do, and it can affect system-wide change. So there was something really awesome that happened. So after my TED Talk came out, which was in December 2018, I was giving a talk um, a couple months later, and this older man came up to me. It was a talk at a university, but he was a uh, uh, from a town a, a ways outside and he had taken the train in to listen to my talk and he said I just want to let you know that I listened to your TED talk and I decided that I was going to have conversations because of this because you said it was important I was like oh that's awesome and he said I've kept a list of all the conversations that I have had and that people I've talked to have had in my town which has about 150 200,000 people over the last three or four months would you like to see the list I was like, yeah, I mean, I figured, you know, 75, 80 names, that's great. So he reaches in his bag and he pulls out this sheaf of papers with over 10,000 names on it. And he said, because we've had these conversations, he said, now they're up to like 12,000, our city voted to declare a climate emergency. So the power of one man having a conversation actually changed the trajectory of his entire city. Hmm. I, that's amazing. But I, I, do have, I do have one... Uh, one question about this though. What if that conversation is awkward? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> then what do you do? Yes. Well, here's the thing. So um, what I've learned is we're only able to have an effective conversation if we begin the conversation with something that we actually agree on, not something we disagree on.
So if we dive right into the science, if we dive right into we're screwed and you're not doing enough and you're a bad person, even if that's the subtext rather than what we're actually saying, that's not going to end well. And that's not the type of conversation I'm advocating for. What I'm advocating for is getting to know somebody, figuring out what makes them tick. Are they really into cooking or hiking or knitting or birding or fishing or skiing or national security or the economy or investing or new technology or, you know, what are they really into? Then you connect the dots between how climate change is already affecting something they already care about, not something different, something they care about, and what is a positive beneficial solution it could be something that they could do personally. It could be something that they could support and endorse or advocate for or, or you know, feel like was consistent with their values. What's a solution that is consistent with their values that would actually help fix the problem in a meaningful way? And those types of conversations can be life altering. Hmm. So as, uh, as I'm kind of thinking, uh, you know, I started this by saying, okay, this could be a catalyst for change. And then, and then you came back with, actually, we might ramp things up. And then I was like, oh yeah. Cause after, after all of this, we might, we might go from, you know, people, people working, you know, eight hour days, like making stuff too quickly. Like I got to make stuff 12 hours a day because I mm -hmm. fell behind and not, and not only do I need to make up for all that lost time and lost income, but now I've been scared straight and I have to stock up and now I need to get enough money so I can build a bunker so that I'm ready next time. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and now you're consuming all these new bunker products and, uh, and, and working harder and working harder than ever. Uh, you definitely, you definitely need to bring back that apocalypse character. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think bunker sales are going are, are gonna to increase after this. Um, uh, but uh, the, the point is, is I, I think that um, uh, uh, con consumption might, uh, like people might go back, uh, like you said, back to not even business as usual, but ramping things up um, a little bit shortly after this. So what, what can people do um, to start having some of these climate conversations in what might be some of the hardest times to get people to change right after this when people are most concerned about their paychecks mm -hmm. um i, I how, how do you have a talk about changing yeah. consumption and, and yes. things like that well, um, let me let me just be really straight here, and that is, it's I'm not as worried about individual consumption as I'm worried about industrial production. Yeah, I mean that's really what's causing most of the carbon emission reductions and air quality improvements that we've seen, and that is likely to ramp back up, back up again because big companies are losing a ton of money. Um, even the companies that produce the parts for battery storage and electric cars and solar panels have been shut down due to the pandemic. Um, and not only that, but there's something really interesting. Did you know that the concept of a personal carbon footprint, the idea that you know, we are personally responsible for climate change, it was not invented by, but it was popularized by a very well-funded um, PR campaign by British Petroleum mm. back about 20 years ago. BP mm. is one of the top 10 com companies that if you look at, there's, there's I think 90 companies are responsible for 70% of carbon emissions since the beginning of the industrial era. Like mm. I'm talking 1700s. And BP is one of the top 10 of those companies. Mm. So really it is about system-wide change. And that's mm. why I think this is actually a great time to kind of take a step back. And a lot of us are consuming a lot of online resources these days to take a step back and to really start kind of, you know, thinking about these issues like, how can I work something into my kids' curriculum as I'm struggling to keep them busy through the hours when they're home? Well, we have a great series on YouTube called Global Weirding uh, that mm. talks all about the questions people have about climate change. There's another one of our sister shows called Hot Mess um, that also talks about um, climate change and how it affects us. There's a lot of materials we can use to learn from. And it, make sure and send me all the links and I'll make sure and put them oh, in the description and everything yeah. else so people can easily find them. 
I would love to do that. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, as we're grocery shopping, it's a great time to consider new recipes. I've been experimenting with new recipes, look at more plant-based recipes, how we can, you know, use less meat and eat in a more healthy way. Um, it might be a good chance to go around the house and say, yeah, let's actually take a look at, you know, our light bulbs and things like that. But it's also a great time to say, hey, as we ramp back up again, where I live, for example, if you live down the whole middle of the country, wind energy is cheaper than natural gas and it's way cheaper than coal. So as we ramp back up and we're trying to look for ways to cut our costs, what if we looked at a way to get our electricity for our company or our business from a different source that might end up being cheaper? Hmm. What if we looked at doing things a different way? What if we looked at doing an energy audit of our building if we have a big facility? Um, one of my colleagues, he, he does energy audits for churches. And he saves them quite a bit of money just through doing an energy audit that reduces their energy use, cuts their carbon footprint, but also saves them a lot of money that they can use for things they care more about. What if we looked at ways to be more efficient with the resources we have, including virtual travel as opposed to flying everywhere, what we eat, how we use energy, where we get our energy from. This is a great opportunity, I think, to kind of regroup and think about how could we be more high tech and more efficient with all the resources we have, because by doing so, a lot of times we'll save ourselves time, we'll save ourselves money, and we'll save ourselves carbon too. Mm. Oh, I'm trying to think of this guy's name I had on my, my live show, Stand Up Science, where I have academics give talks. Um, oh, boy, this is embarrassing. I'll try, uh, uh, so bad with names. But I, I had someone talking about um, this is what happens when you do too many shows a week. Um, I, I, they were kind of talking about environmental um, or, or more sustainable um, and efficient architecture so uh, there were there were simple things in terms of mm -hmm. most houses are built and you put insulation between the studs mm -hmm. and instead having having that insulation going over the studs so there's not mm -hmm. there's not the gaps in there and and just like some changes like that that were that were able to much better insulate homes and then and he was showing kind of um ca thermal cameras Mm -hmm. of like the the temperature of a house on the outside that was poorly insulated and on the inside to show show heat loss and and where all all of the heat or or cooling was was escaping and um and it's just it seems like there's just a million different options for people that uh not only are are, are you doing something good for the environment but it's it's building um, efficiencies for yourself and, and saving mm -hmm. money in the in the long run. Exactly. And then the most important thing again to do is when you do one of these things, talk about it. I mean, we're all having, you know, FaceTime or Zoom meetings with our family and our friends to kind of, you know, keep in touch, practicing social distancing or sorry, practicing physical, physical distancing, distancing, but yeah. bringing ourselves together socially. Yeah. So talk about it because sharing this with people is a really effective way to create change. I mean, you know, just as an example, so, um, you know, a lot, of, um, a lot of kids and teenagers are very conscious. And so I know a teenager who was really conscious about their family's carbon footprint. She convinced her parents to stop flying. Um, they stopped eating meat. They really significantly reduced their carbon emissions. But nobody knew anything about her. And she had really you know, no influence other than, you know, talking to the few people she knew. And then she decided to take a piece of white cardboard and she decided to write some words on it that said Fridays for Future, and she decided to sit outside a building and hold that sign. And because she used her voice, everybody in the world knows her name now, and her name's Greta. Mm. Mm. That's amazing. Yeah, she's an impressive young lady. Yep. Um, and, it, and it was because she mm. actually not only did something, but she told everybody about it. So mm. I would encourage people absolutely 100% Find a carbon footprint calculator, enter your family's carbon, you know, where you, you know, what you eat, how far you travel, how big a house you live in, get your kids to do it. It's a fantastic exercise for kids. Mm -hmm. And then look at ways that you can reduce your carbon footprint. But then don't forget the last thing at the bottom, which is the most important, which is talk about it, share that information with people, post what you did on social media, share it with your relatives while you're talking to them. And when you go back to work, have a conversation at your place of work about what you can do as a whole to be more efficient. Hmm. Um, I keep on, my, my mind's still <laughs> stuck on this. Uh, this was a fascinating idea that you brought up about the, um, 
about the idea of the carbon footprint that was popularized by first by uh, what what company did you say? British Uh-oh. Petroleum. BP. Oh, BP. Okay. Mm-hmm. Gosh, I thought they had all our best interests in heart. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, I, this is this feels like a real betrayal right now. Um, but I it, it it kind of reminds me of back before. Um, back before seatbelts and in the auto industry didn't want to put seatbelts in until kind of uh, Ralph Nader uh, made, made the many pushes to, to start changing the way uh, in which car safety was done. But the, the car companies tried to run ads saying, well, this is, this is all the fault of reckless drivers uh, and, and putting, it, uh, putting the ownership on the, uh, on the individual. And, well, and, you're absolutely right. And I have another example too. Yeah. <laughs> so um, way back when we used to get all of our drinks in containers that had to be returned, right? Yeah. So they were in glass containers and you had to return them. And in fact, I actually grew up in South America in Colombia, and there you would get um, a bunch of, you know, soda delivered to your door every week. And then you would put your empty bottles back out in order to get full ones returned. And if you were at a convenience store and you wanted a Coke, you would order the Coke, but you'd have to drink it there because you have to give the bottle back to them. So of course in America, you know, decades ago, people invented disposable bottles, right? Well then soon we had a horrible waste problem. There were food containers and bottles and cans everywhere. So what did they do? they put a ton of money into creating the Keep America Beautiful campaign. Mm. They told people, you are throwing these containers away. You are the ones who are being dirty. We will help you organize into crews to pick up all the trash, to recycle all the trash, to do all this with the trash that we create and we benefit from financially because it's a lot cheaper for us to just fund and keep America beautiful than it is for us to actually stop producing um, trash. Wow. I mean, it's Blowing. impressively <laughs> clever. <laughs> it is. Uh, uh, wow. Um, so so you, you totally have to check out, and yeah. um, I would encourage you to have on your show, um, somebody called Naomi Oreskes or Jeff Supin, who, who also works with her. So either Jeff or Naomi, because they study the fossil fuel companies, and they study the PR techniques that they have been mm. using since the 1980s, when their own scientists were telling them, yeah, climate change is real, here's how much of the Arctic it's gonna open up to new oil and gas extraction as the Arctic melts. And then at the same time, they were buying the best spin doctors in the business, including the guys, the very same people who were employed by the, tobac- the tobacco industry. When they lost their jobs in the tobacco industry, trying to say that smoking doesn't cause lung cancer, they got hired by the fossil fuel industry. So the book and the documentary called Merchants of Doubt by Naomi Oreskes lays this out. And Naomi and her colleague Jeff Suprin have gone on and studied this in great detail. And they would be fantastic people to have on the show. They will boggle your mind. I would love to have them. <laughs> yes. um, you, you, brought up, um, you brought up smoking. Um, what, what about the idea of a, uh, of a syntax? Is that just another way in which uh, we're passing the buck to the consumer? Or is it, is it, um, it, is there anything useful that can come out of it? If, if a syntax is theoretically making, making people with say cigarettes, um, uh, making it cost more and deterring them from, from smoking or, or making them pay kind of the full cost of, of, uh, smoking much in the way that, um, rather than say subsidizing, um, oil companies and and giving them um, money to make their job easier and and uh, cheaper to do, um, in instead turning things around to uh, so that oil actually reflects the cost of oil, the cost on the environment, mm-hmm. and um, uh, yeah. So uh, yes. is, is there anything like that 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 you would um, that you would like to see happen? Well, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. Uh, Because when we look at fossil fuels, their direct subsidies are actually about double that of renewables in the US. But when you factor in the indirect subsidies of all the drilling on public lands, the um, pollution, the climate impacts, when you add in the indirect subsidies, they are subsidized the tune of over $600 billion per year, which exceeds the Pentagon's budget. 
So not only are we, you know, using these fuels, but we are financially being incentivized to use them because the price we pay is not the real cost. Who's bearing the real cost? Us. So ironically, fossil fuels are so subsidized that they're actually socialized. The cost of fossil fuels are being socialized. And it's ironic because, of course, all the opponents to climate action are like, oh, those people are such socialists. They want climate action. Well, they're actually benefiting from the social socialization of the cost of using fossil fuels. We are paying the cost and they are reaping the profits. Um, but here's the problem. It's really hard to remove the indirect subsidies. You can remove the direct subsidies, but the indirect subsidies are really challenging to remove um, in any way other than this. And this is what you're referring to. The idea of putting a price on carbon that is equal to the indirect subsidies, so we're actually paying the real price when we buy carbon, that is a climate solution that is endorsed by pretty much every economist in the world, including the two that won the Nobel Prize for economics um, a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. The idea is, is that you put a price on carbon, it starts low, but it ramps up, and what it does is you collect this pot of money, and you don't just put this pot of money in the government's pocket you return a lot of this money to the individual person. So people who are struggling to make ends meet aren't harmed by it. And then you use some of it to incentivize efficiency and clean energy technology to make it even cheaper. So here's the interesting thing. This is so fascinating. Nobody knows this. According to the Climate Leadership Council, which was a very revolutionary organization founded by like Ford and AT&T and even ExxonMobil, I'm using that, I'm using revolutionaries <laughs> sarcastically. According to the Climate Leadership Council, which has um, Republicans like Jim Baker and George Schultz on its council, a price on carbon in the U.S. that would effectively reduce carbon emissions to meet the U.S. Paris target would return $2,000 dollars to the average family of four across the country every year mm. and it would it would cut carbon in canada we've had a price on carbon um, in a couple of provinces now for quite some time british columbia had a price on carbon since 2007 and they use the revenues to reduce personal income taxes to the lowest level in canada and reduce corporate income tax to the, one of the lowest levels in the entire north america and they led the country in economic productivity. The four provinces that had a price on carbon led the whole country. And then now, as of just this past year, they made the carbon tax a national um, tax in Canada. So you are absolutely mm. right. There is a solution that's endorsed by Republicans. And it's even promoted by oil companies. But they sort of promote it like this. Yes, I support a price on carbon. But, you know, do we really have to act on this? I'm not sure. It's probably all your fault for eating fruit out of season and buying too much fast fashion at H&M. But I do support a price on carbon. If we actually had to put that forward, I would support it. So yeah. what, I, what I think is the oil companies really have to reverse their messaging. <laughs> right. And huh. some of them might be willing to do it. Some of them might be not willing to do it. Um, but that's really the choice that they confront today. And morally and ethically, as well as just looking to their bottom dollar, dollar long term, there's a very clear choice. And that is we have to fix climate change. So what... I have um, two very similar questions. What could a um, what could an oil company say mm -hmm. and and do that would that would um, that would get you to be like, all right, I like what this oil <laughs> company is doing. I yeah. support this oil company over the other oil companies. I, I think about that question um, because I follow what they do. In fact, I actually worked for ExxonMobil as a graduate student for, for a year. Mm -hmm. um, I interned with them. So here's what I see companies doing, and I don't see any company that's doing the whole package yet. So first of all, um, British Petroleum, BP, has set a target. So they actually said they want to be carbon neutral by 2050. So setting a target is a great thing. And then Exxon, for example, has said, we're going to invest a ton of money in new clean energy technology. They've only invested a tiny fraction of what they said they're going to invest. But they've said, you know, we're going to develop new clean energy technology. So setting a target, investing very heavily in new clean energy technology, number two. Number three, publicly and loudly supporting a price on carbon. Because that would just level the whole playing field. That would allow a lot of other companies to really put money into new clean energy technology. That would actually incentivize them to put more money into new clean energy technology. A price on carbon is really a system-wide approach that we need very badly. So that's step number three. And then step number four is stop. Stop 
denial. Stop funding denial organizations. Stop writing false letters to newspapers. Stop funding um, you know, fake experts. Stop all the denial machine which you are funding. So set a target, invest in real clean energy solutions in a meaningful way, advocate loudly and with lots of money and all the weight of your industry behind it with the politicians in your pocket for a price on carbon and stop funding denial. If I met a company that did that, I would be like, heck, you want a climate scientist to endorse you? I will endorse you. I will make ads for you for free. I will support you if you're willing to do all four of those things. Hmm. Why aren't, it just seems like, there's real opportunity for, I mean, yes. these guys, these guys have a lot <laughs> yes. of resources. They, they, they have scientists that they work with. They yes. have, they have brains working for them. Yes. They have people that are able to project and, uh, and, you know, put together probabilistic outcomes about the future. And mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I, my, my first girlfriend was a, a geochemist from MIT that that eventually um, started working for an oil company to find oil uh, and now she doesn't even use her background because she's been shifted into the clean energy um, the side side of things just because it's not even worth their expense anymore to find oil that basically doesn't exist um, and or, or won't for very long and so, so why, why not take advantage of the new opportunity? Why not, why not build the monopoly on, on clean energy and, and profit from clean energy? I, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I mean, say yeah. you're the most evil energy corporation in the world. What, uh, why, what's to stop you from profiting even more from clean energy? Mm-hmm what's what's the hold up <laughs> exactly well i i completely agree with that perspective but there are a couple hold ups hold up number one quarterly returns right quarterly returns um you what what you're suggesting is a very sensible long-term plan if you said you know what we're not going to look at any of our financial returns over a time frame shorter than 10 years then 100 percent, it would make sense to do exactly what you say but if you are a slave to the quarterly returns, then there is there, you know, there could be a dip in the quarterly returns, number one. Number two, and this one's a bit of a nuance, and I actually learned this one through a conversation with somebody in the oil and gas industry here in Texas. And I, it, it, it's going to sound obvious when I say it, but I hadn't quite put the pieces together. Uh, in the majority of cases, clean energy is not a product business. It's a technology business. So clean energy is like Tesla has more in common with Apple than it has in common with Chevron Hmm. because you're producing wind turbines, not the actual wind. You're producing solar panels, not the actual solar energy. Hmm. You're producing technology. So people are buying your technology. It's as if they're buying airplanes or as if they're buying cell phones. And then they're using your technology to produce energy. Whereas with oil and gas, you're producing something that actually keeps the car running. You have a car, but it is a useless chunk of metal if you don't have a full gas tank. So you're producing this continuous supply. So the return on investment is radically different if you're producing clean energy technology versus if you're producing oil and gas. The only difference is this, and this is why Exxon is investing in this, biofuels. So with biofuels, liquid biofuels, which you can produce from algae or from agricultural waste products, liquid biofuels are a fuel like oil and gas. So if you still have an airplane, you can run the exact same airplane off biofuel. And in fact, United Airlines is already doing this out of the LAX airport. You can run the same airplane off biofuel as you can off oil and gas. Um, And so you'd still be producing biofuels. So that's what Exxon has been investing in because they would still be a producer of the fuel. Um, But for the rest of the energy sources, they would be in a very different business niche. And that is a challenge. Mm. Isn't that interesting? I had never put those pieces quite together. Um, And so the whole return on investment thing is very different. Mm. Like you don't, you don't find a resource in the ground and dig it up and sell it. Um, That gets you a lot of money really quickly. Whereas what Elon Musk did, it didn't get him a lot of money really quickly. It did get him a lot of money, but it took quite a bit of time and there's significant bumps along the way. Mm -hmm. Hmm. 
it still just seems with the resources and, and the kind of infrastructure that oil companies already have in place, if you already have all of these gas stations yes. and everything else, it, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, well, yeah, they have the infrastructure. They could just have batteries that you just lift out and put in your car so you don't have to charge your battery. Um, and here's the thing. China's doing it. Here in the U.S., one of the arguments I hear all the time is, what about China? Because people think they're still building a new coal-fired power plant a day. That's old news. That's from 10 years ago. They've shut down all the coal-fired power plants around Beijing. They're selling their coal to poor countries. And they have more wind and solar energy than any other country in the world. Why? Because they are a dictatorship. They work over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. They don't care if they have a short-term dip. They don't care if they have to invest a lot now to benefit in 10 years because that's the way their government is set up. And so, so <laughs> sometimes I jokingly say, and reality is starting to happen, I jokingly yeah. say, you know, if we had a monarchy where you'd have the same person in power for 50 or 60 years and then their child would inherit, maybe we'd have the motivation to change instead of having politicians that turn over every four years. Well, we, have, well, we now have Prince Harry and Meghan. So how about putting them in charge? Yeah. That's just a joke, but there's a grain of truth in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we certainly have an aspiring dictator in in charge of uh, <laughs> in charge of the country. That's that's a start. Um, Somehow, I don't think that would achieve the desired result. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> um, I uh, so oh, jeez. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I have I have two. I think very good questions for you okay. before before I get you out of here. Um, one. What is your favorite um, either clean energy, new energy technology, oh. or, or ideal portfolio of, of clean? Because I also recognize that, that you know, some areas are going to be good for wind energy. Some areas, like maybe in the south, are better for solar. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what's, your, uh, what's your kind of, what, what excites you? Um, what, what gives you hope? Oh, oh I love that. Um, I, what gives you hope is the biggest question that I've gotten from people across North America, the UK and Europe over the last two years. And um, I've turned it back on them and I've actually started to collect their answers. And what gives uh -oh. us hope? Yeah, yeah. So I can tell you. No, I'm, I'm asking the questions around here. Don't, don't, you don't want to come to me for answers. Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, what other people told me. And what they tell us is the first thing that gives us hope is people. So seeing other people act gives us hope. And then new technology also gives us hope. So in terms of a portfolio, I really like the portfolio that Project Drawdown lays out. They have 100 solutions to climate change. Some of them are related to transportation. Some are related to electricity. Some are related to uh, food and agricultural production, land use management, education, innovation. I love Project Drawdown. I think it just kind of covers the whole gamut. Um, if you ask me personally, though, what am I, what am I personally most excited about? Um, I'm most excited about the things that are nearest and dearest to my heart. So let me give you a couple of the things that I'm really excited about. Uh, first of all, um, I love the fact that one of the biggest contributors to climate change that isn't fossil fuels is food waste. We throw out about 40% of the food we reduce. So reducing food waste is something so simple that every child can do it, every person can do it, every family can do it. I love that reducing food waste is so simple and it saves us money. So I stopped doing massive grocery shops, you know, where I went like every two weeks and I stocked up the extra freezer. I sold the extra freezer. I put my shopping bags in my car. I figured out what grocery store was on the way home from work and I go two or three times a week and we eat a lot fresher food and I just love that. The fact that we're eating better and it reduces our food waste. Um, this is this is something we can do, hopefully in the near-ish future. But I'm oh, not yes. sure right now. That's the well. Most right now, we are eating to the very back of the freezer before we go grocery shopping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think we are. I'm, I'm down yeah. to the rum cake that somebody made me for Christmas. Like that's literally what we're eating. Right now. Um, the the second thing. So, Whoever, whoever I, I hope they're not. Who, whoever made you that rum cake is just finding now, out now that that, was, <laughs> that that they gave you your last resort. Well, no, she told me to freeze it when she gave it to me because okay. she gave me away for Christmas. And she actually said it was this wonderful Texan lady. She said, "Grill it on the barbecue." And I was okay. Like, She's like, "Yeah, you slice it and you grill it." I was like, "Okay, <laughs> so it's really good." Um, then um, two two Christmases ago, the week before Christmas. Um, I got one of those emails that you dread. It said like, somebody's been checking your credit report. And I was like, 
oh my gosh. And so I went running to my husband. I was like, oh my goodness, identity theft. Somebody's like got my social security number. What are we going to do? And he's like, no, no, it's okay. And I'm like, what do you mean it's okay? He's like, well, it's okay. And I was like, it's not okay. And he's like, I know about it. It's okay. And I'm like, what do you mean you know about it? <laughs> and so he's like, well, I can't tell you. I, I said, well, why can't I tell you? He's like, because it has to do with Christmas. And so it took a little while. I finally got it out of it. He finally cracked like two days before Christmas. He had bought us solar panels for the house. He bought them, and this is the part I love. He bought them from a local company that the last time oil prices tanked a few years ago, they took in all the guys who lost their jobs out in the oil patch, who just had like high school educations. They took them in and they gave them full-time permanent jobs manufacturing solar panels. And we bought our solar panels from a local company that was employing local Texans, which I absolutely love. So that's my second favorite. Mm -hmm. And then my third favorite one that I'm really hopeful for in the future is biofuel for airplanes. Um, I live 30 hours away from my family. I have to fly to visit them. Um, flying is the biggest part of my carbon footprint. So I maximize my time when I fly. I do all kinds of other trips and events there, you know, to schedule everything together. But I am really excited about uh, biofuel airplanes um, and electric airplanes for short haul uh, because I love to travel. I love to see new things. I love to take my family to see new things and new people and just kind of broaden our horizons. But I can't in good conscience, you know, be trotting off to Indonesia if I know that that's going to burn a whole year's worth of carbon while doing so. So I'm super excited about the potential for travel, for carbon neutral travel. And uh, lastly, my favorite project drawdown solution is number six on their list, education of women and girls in poor countries. Mm. I love that because that just hits close to my heart. The more educated a woman is, even if we've completed elementary school or if we've completed middle school, the longer the lives of our children, the lower the infant mortality rate. Um, and as a mom, I mean, I, 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 I'm almost tearing up thinking about it. I can't even imagine the heartbreak of having, you know, having eight children because I have no access to birth control and having half of my children die before the age of five due to waterborne diseases or pollution or lack of food, and then just be struggling to just put food in the mouths of my children who remain. Educating women and girls decreases infant mortality, increases the prosperity of woman-led households in poor countries, and ironically, and you can read Project Drought to learn more about it, it reduces carbon emissions too. So that really is, I think, the best one to end with. That's the one that's nearest and dearest to my heart because climate change disproportionately affects the poorest people in this world. But by helping those people, we can actually help fix the problem. Mm. Amazing. Well, uh, that would be a good enough place to end, but I have one more fantastic question for you. Absolutely. You're, you're, you're just, <laughs> I just know you're just going to have such a good answer. So, so I, I, can't, I can't let this one slide. What, um, it's, it's, a uh, you, you already got a similar question, but, um, I just, anyway, um, what would a, uh, what would a politician, um, what, what could a politician say or do to get your vote that you'd be ah. really excited about? <laughs> um, they could have a viable climate policy that would actually make a difference. So um, I don't generally tend to, I, I definitely don't endorse any politicians in the U.S. I'm not even a U.S. citizen. I can't vote here. Um, I can certainly speak to the efficiency and the efficacy of their climate plans. But uh, we had an election back in Canada in uh, the fall of 2019. So what I did was I got together with a colleague of mine who's an economist, Andrew Leach, and we rated our party's plans on climate. We have a conservative party, a liberal party, an NDP party, a green party. We also have the Bloc Québécois and we have the People's Party of Canada. So we have a broad range of parties. And we rated them all based on two things. We rated them based on ambition, right? So how ambitious are they? But we rapidly realized that we also had to rate them on feasibility. Because you could say, I'm gonna reach for the moon, but if you don't have a plan to get to the moon, what's the point, right? You have to actually have a plan to get there. So it was interesting because we, we gave the Green Party an A plus on, on ambition, but we had to give them a C on feasibility because their ambition included the federal government doing some things that it didn't have the mandate to do. The provincial government had the mandate to do that, but not all the provinces are going to agree with them. Certainly not Alberta, which is the Texas of Canada. They're not going to agree with the federal government, especially if it was a Green Party. So we had to give them a C for feasibility. Whereas the liberals, we gave them a B for ambition because their ambition was kind of, you know, middle of the road. 
but they learned the hard way. And so they got an A for feasibility because they were actually proposing to do something they could accomplish. Um, so that's what's really important when it comes to our politicians. We want them to be ambitious and a lot of them lack that ambition, but the ambition has to be coupled with feasibility. And our Liberal Party in Canada was the one that put the price on carbon. And the price on carbon is actually reducing carbon emissions while allowing the economy to grow. It wasn't quite enough. We pushed them pretty hard to up their ambition. And I'm really grateful and thankful that after they won the election, they, they did up their ambition. Mm. And they did that because of the other parties pushing them to, which was great. Um, but that's what we really need is we need ambition and we need feasibility from our politicians. Mm. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Catherine Hayhoe, for joining me today. Uh, you, you are terrific. Oh, you are too. I look forward to seeing the return of the apocalyptic comedian because we need that type of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Please keep it up. I will. Uh, thank you, listeners, for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you next episode. Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are.